Welcome back to the Whitmer Cast, a podcast by the John Whitmer Historical Association. We bring you essays, interviews, panel discussions, and broadcasts related to Mormon history and restoration studies. My name is Jason Smith, and today we'll be sharing a session from our 50th anniversary meeting entitled Gnostic Mormonism, the History and Scriptures of Three Gnostic Branches of the Latter-day Saint Movement, presented by Mike Lechemanon. In this session, Mike discusses the scriptures and beliefs of three lesser-known branches of the Smith Rigdon Movement. If you'd like to join JWHA or visit our entire backlog of episodes and journals, go to www.jwha.info. With that out of the way, let's get started. So I'd like to welcome you to Breakout Session 254. I'm David Wilson, and our subject today is Nast. The Gnostic Mormonism, the history and scriptures of the three Gnostic branches of Latter-day Saint movement. Mike Lashamana is our uh, speaker. I'd like to make sure you have your cell phones muted and if you could wear a mask so Mike doesn't feel the need to, we'd appreciate that. Mike uh, earned a BA from Brigham Young University and a DMD from the University of Louisville. He then completed a general dental residency at Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton and an endodontics residency at the University of Southern California. He is now in private practice in Houston, Texas, specializing in root canals. He has seven children and six dogs. I guess hopefully his presentation will not be. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome Mike, and, and because he's the only presenter, we're going to allow him a little leeway on our time today. Thank you. Okay, let me just open this up. Well, I appreciate you coming. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, I actually... Well, I came here from Texas, but I actually grew up in Independence, um, Independence, Kansas, that is. Uh, but I've always felt a special connection with this city here in Missouri. Today I'll be speaking about three small branches of the Smith Rigdon movement that have incorporated aspects of Gnosticism into their teachings. My hope is to shed some light into one small corner of the larger Mormon world, and I hope this will provide us with some insight into the development of the early church. Since we'll be discussing Gnosticism, it may help to start by defining that term. Gnosis means knowledge, especially the knowledge of spiritual mysteries. The writings of the Gnostics were lost until they were discovered in 1945 in Nag Hammadi, Egypt, and translated into English in 1977. The doctrines of Gnosticism are complex, but one distinctive teaching is that Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament and creator of the material world, is not the true God, but is a malevolent demiurge. The goal of Gnosticism is to escape this material world and its God in order to find the true God in the spiritual realm inside of us. The first group I'll be discussing is the Gnostic Temple of the Pearl. Founded in 1974 as the Church of Christ Patriarchal, the name was then changed to the Evangelical Church of Christ, the Church of the New Covenant in Christ, the Church of the Pearl, and just two years ago to the Gnostic Temple of the Pearl. This group was founded by John W. Bryant, who also goes by the name Mar Samuel, Mar meaning Lord in Aramaic. This slide shows three pictures of Bryant with one of his wives. The one on the right was taken at the wedding of their son, Coram. Bryant was born in 1946 and grew up in New Hampshire. As a young adult, he found a copy of the Book of Mormon in the public library, became converted to it, joined the LDS Church, and served a mission to Japan. Soon after his mission, he came to believe in the principle of plural marriage and joined the Apostolic United Brethren, also known as the AUB or All Red Group. He and his first two wives moved to the AUB community in Pinesdale, Montana, and in 1974 he began having a series of heavenly visitations by John the Beloved, Brigham Young, John Taylor, 
Joseph W. Musser, and Lawrence C. Woolley. He was also taken in vision to the city of Enoch, where he received the second anointing, was sealed to Joseph Smith, Jr., and was called by him to be the one mighty and strong. Needless to say, these visions created a rift between John Bryant and Rulin C. Allred, the prophet of the AUB. So Bryant and his followers left and formed the Church of Christ Patriarchal in Salt Lake City. He then had an interesting experience in which he was visited by the wife of one of the three Nephites, who conferred upon him the, quote, higher light of Christ through a sexual ordination. Bryant then set out to confer this same gift on all of his followers, developing a unique system of plural marriage, which included three types of sealings, either for eternity, for a month, or for a day. <laughs> yep. the, these sealings were both polygynous and polyandrous, as well as bisexual. Not only did he insist on approving every sexual encounter between his followers, but he also participated in most of them. In 1979, the word patriarchal was removed from the name of the church in an effort to be less misogynistic, and the group became the Evangelical Church of Christ, evangelical and patriarchal being synonyms according to Joseph Smith. They moved from Salt Lake City to a ranch in Nevada owned by one of their members, and most outsiders viewed them as a free love hippie commune. Few of them, if any, had jobs, and within two years they ran out of money and the ranch was foreclosed on. The church split into several factions, but the majority followed Bryant to Salem, Oregon, where they obtained a small farm and created the Church of the New Covenant in Christ. At the height of its success, the church grew to 120 members. It was at this point that Bryant started studying the Nag Hammadi Library and adopted some of their doctrines. He came to the conclusion that Mormonism was actually Gnostic from the beginning. He also started turning away from fundamentalism by ceasing additional plural marriages, ordaining women to the priesthood, and interpreting scriptures metaphorically. In 1990... Oh. Oh, okay. In 1997, Bryant faced legal battles regarding zoning restrictions when they converted a barn into a church building and they were forced off the property. He moved again, this time to San Diego, establishing the Church of the Pearl, named after the Gnostic Hymn of the Pearl. In 2020, Bryant renamed it to the Gnostic Temple of the Pearl and they currently have about 20 active members. This slide shows all of the scriptures in their canon. They use the Bible, especially the Gospel of John, and the Book of More Good, which is what they call the Book of Mormon, referring to a statement written by W.W. W. Phelps, but attributed to Joseph Smith, saying that Mormon means more good. They also use the Book of Covenants, which is their version of the Doctrine and Covenants. The other texts in the upper half of the screen are mostly pseudepigraphical writings of Old Testament prophets, and those on the lower half are inspired translations of some of the Nag Hammadi texts, um, with Bryant's versions on the left and the corresponding Gnostic texts on the right. Having written over a thousand pages of material, I'd submit to you that John Bryant has given Joseph Smith Jr. a run for his money in terms of producing new scripture. This slide shows some examples of the intertextuality between Bryant's writings and LDS scriptures with the verses in each column closely corresponding with one another. Here's another picture of him more recently. Um, Every Sunday they have online worship services, and I've attended several of them. They start off with 30 minutes of singing, followed by a metaphysical lecture given by Bryant and a discussion led by his son. They then have a yoga class, a meditation session, and something they call icon time, which involves drawing pictures. Their Sunday services don't include prayers or communion, 
but these are offered twice a month at the fast of the new moon. They fast for two days in a row and have a sacrament service each evening. These services are scripted and liturgical, involving the blowing of a shofar, the lighting of candles, and the ringing of bells. On the first evening, they have a communion of bread and wine, and on the second evening, they partake of fruit and ale. Three times a year, they have a third communion using vegetables and brandy. It's fascinating to me the way in which this group has evolved from a patriarchal fundamentalist sect to a feminist free love commune and then to a liberal Gnostic church. Let me share a quote from one of Bryant's wives who ended up leaving him and his church but had some positive things to say about him. She said, people like John are either sure they have all the answers or they're in the process of getting them. Part of his charisma was that he wasn't just some con man selling a bill of goods to gullible people. He was so single-minded in his own search for God that his enthusiasm created a sense of certainty. He believed that, God, that he was being led by God, and his sincerity and intelligence convinced others. Next, I'll mention a few people of interest who are followers of John Bryant. So, pictured here are Ron and Dan Lafferty of Under the Banner of Heaven fame, with Dan on the left and Ron on the right. Ron visited Bryant in Oregon twice for a week each time, but he never officially joined with them, instead becoming a part of Robert Crossfield's School of the Prophets. The Lafferty's, of course, were both convicted of murder, and Ron died in prison in 2019, just a couple of months before his scheduled execution. Leland Freeborn, also known as the Parowan Prophet, was the president of Bryant's Quorum of Twelve Apostles, but then split off to form the Kingdom of God Incorporated. One day, he crashed his airplane and had a near-death experience in which he was told to prepare for World War III. Every year, he travels in his RV to each of the LDS temples in Utah, warning everyone of an impending nuclear apocalypse. He may be right. He may be. <laughs> he makes his living building underground bunkers and selling survival supplies and seer stones. One of Freeborn's followers was Samuel Schaefer. He served a mission for the LDS Church here in Missouri, and later, while in the celestial room of the Mount Timpanogos Temple, he received an audible revelation commanding him to practice polygamy. He then saw the Parowan Prophet's RV, read everything on his website, and convinced his wife to investigate with him. Um, on the lower right is a photo of them being taught in Freeborn's house. They were both baptized by Freeborn and moved to Parowan, Utah, but pretty soon she left and filed for divorce. Schaefer spent several years in the Kingdom of God and wrote his own book of scripture, the Book of Joseph, uh, which he published in a book titled Priceless Gems, along with some of John Bryant's writings. Schaefer and Freeborn parted ways, um, and Schaefer briefly joined the Church of the Pearl before starting his own church, the Church of the Diamond. <laughs> I suppose he figured that diamonds were more valuable than pearls. <laughs> he then changed the name to the Patriarchal Order of the Church of Christ, which he then merged with Mark Lichtenwalter's Latter-day Kingdom, forming the Church of the Living Messiah. Lichtenwalter, by the way, had previously split from the Church of Jesus Christ Bullaite, founded by Art Bulla. In 2017, Schaefer was excommunicated by Lichtenwalter and then teamed up with John Colthorpe to, to form the Knights of the Crystal Blade. Things took a turn for the worse when they kidnapped their own children from their ex-wives and took them to live in an abandoned storage container in the middle of the southern Utah desert. Even worse, they married each other's eight-year-old daughters. Fortunately, they were captured and convicted of their crimes along with the third man who was also involved. Not all of Bryant's followers were unstable, however. Robert Lloyd 
had a bachelor's degree in philosophy, a master's in marriage and family therapy, and a PhD in psychology. And he wrote a book titled The Knowledge That Leads to Wholeness, which compares Gnosticism with Jungian psychology. Also known by the name Zedek, he was the church's musical director, composing and recording nine albums of Gnostic hymns. Here are the covers of the nine albums, the artwork coming from icons drawn by church members. You'll notice the definite Latter-day Saint connection with the first album cover in the upper left. And the seventh album contains lyrics written by Eliza R. Snow. Unfortunately, Robert Lloyd passed away with COVID in 2020. The second Gnostic church I'll be discussing was founded in 1981 as the Church of the Firstborn, but soon became known as Sons Amen Israel. According to Orson Pratt, Sons Amen means Sons of God in the Adamic language. The spelling of Amen was changed from A-H-M to A-U-M in order to incorporate the Sanskrit letter Am, which symbolizes the ultimate reality of the universe. In 1998, the name was changed to the Order of Nazarene Essenes, abbreviated as ONE, uh, with colons. Um, the image at the top center of the slide was the seal of Sons Amen Israel, and the other images come from the Order of Nazarene Essenes' current website. They've informally gone by several other names, including Amun's Desert Monastery, New Qumran, the Manichaean Orthodox Church, and the School of the Prophetic Ones. This group was founded by Gilbert Clark. Not to be confused with Clark Gilbert, who is the LDS Church's Commissioner of Education. He also goes by the names David Asia Israel and Abba Yese Nasre. But I'll just refer to him as Clark so we don't get confused. He was born in 1955 and grew up in San Antonio, Texas. His mother was an inactive member of the LDS Church, and he converted as a young adult. In 1974, he moved to Alaska because he had a revelation commanding him to build a ship so he could sail to the North Pole in search of the Lost Ten Tribes. Before completing construction of the ship, however, he was visited by Jesus and Adam, who told him to study and prepare himself for a great work. He gave up on his North Pole expedition and moved to Salt Lake City, where he spent his time studying in the church history library. He was then visited by Joseph Smith, as a resurrected being, who called him to be the prophet. But when he went to the church office building to inform President Spencer W. Kimball of his new calling, he was excommunicated. <laughs> he then met John Bryant and joined the Evangelical Church of Christ in Nevada. But when the ranch commune fell apart and Bryant moved to Oregon, Clark took a small, fac a small faction to Cane Beds, Arizona, just down the road from the FLDS community of Colorado City. And these are pictures of his cane beds property taken in the 1980s. The lower pictures show the building containing their baptismal font, where each person was baptized every day. The members of the group spent most of their time studying, fasting, meditating, gardening, and producing pottery. They were strictly vegetarian, sabbatarian, and polygamous. They celebrated the Old Testament festivals, performed temple endowments, and did not drink alcohol or watch anything containing violence, including sports. They ordained women to the priesthood and had eight levels of priesthood in addition to the Aaronic and Melchizedek. Every morning they prayed to Jesus, and every evening they prayed to Mary Magdalene. In 1982, Clark was visited by the angel Nephi, who gave him the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon to translate, which he published as the Oracles of Mahanrai, Mahanrai Moriankamer being the name of the brother of Jared, which was revealed to Joseph Smith Jr. when he gave this name to the baby of Reynolds Cahoon. Here we see three other individuals who have also pub published versions of the sealed portion. Christopher Namalka from Utah, 
the founder of A Marvelous Work and a Wonder, Mauricio Berger from Brazil, who's associated with both the restructured Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the Fellowships of the Remnant Movement, also known as Snufferites. And third is Ron Livingston from Iowa, founder of the Brotherhood of Christ Church, not to be confused with the Church of the Christian Brotherhood. That was founded by R.C. Evans, a counselor to Joseph Smith III. I couldn't find a photo of Ron Livingston, but this is a picture of a house at his Essene community near Lamoni. So he's another uh, Essene church founder. Um, Gilbert Clark's communal experiment lasted 14 years, and in 1995 he moved to Northern California, moving Sons Amen Israel, or merging Sons Amen Israel with the Essene Church of Christ, which was founded by David Day Owen. Despite its name, the Essene Church of Christ has no Latter-day Saint connection. Clark <coughs> renamed Sons Amen Israel to the Order of Nazarene Essenes, becoming an independent holy order within the Essene Church of Christ. And here are some images from their website in the early 2000s. Clark adopted the teachings of the Nazareans, also known as the Mandians, who are considered to be the first Gnostics. And he also adopted the teachings of the Essenes, who were an ascetic, mystical sect of Judaism, and the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls. In addition, he became a believer in the Persian prophet Mani, the founder of Manichaeism, which combines Gnostic Christianity with Buddhism and Zoroastrianism. The picture on the right portrays <coughs> Jesus and his wife, Mary Magdalene, the co-messiahs, and their spiritual child, Mani. Clark published five books on Gnosticism under the name David Asia Israel. The book on the right is a 500-page treatise published in 2006 um, attempting to prove that Jesus, or Yeshu, was a Gnostic Nazarene Essene. Clark hasn't been active online since 2008, and all references to his identity, his history with Mormonism, and the oracles of Mahanrai have been removed from his website. I haven't heard anything else about him since then. Next, I'll mention two of Gilbert Clark's followers. The first is Lenore Jean Polson Pratt, also known as Heva Pratt. Heva meaning Eve in, in Hebrew, probably Hava. Um, the prof she's known as the prophetess and priestess. An active member of the LDS Church and mother of 10 children, she became converted to John Bryant's writings and left her family to become one of his six wives, even though she was 20 years, old, uh, 20 years his senior. She then left him and joined Gilbert Clark as a co-founder of Sons Am in Israel, becoming a plural wife of Robert Cummins, seen here in the bottom picture. She translated three books of scripture through the use of a seer stone, the writings of Moroni, the second book of Moroni, and the Shalemna. She eventually left Sons Am in Israel, returned to Salt Lake City, and passed away in 2013. I'll read a portion of her obituary written by her children. They said, She had an in-depth knowledge of the scriptures and enjoyed the accolades of being a learned teacher, but she was seduced through her own spiritual pride to leave the church and then the family. She eventually rejoined the family, and when faced with her own mortality, she expressed regret for some of her previous actions. Before she passed, she sought rebaptism into the LDS Church. Just two years ago, her writings were canonized uh, by the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship, founded by David Ferriman in Ohio. Her writings have also been used by other groups that are no longer in existence, such as the Peace Monastery and the Light of Christ Ministry. Another follower of Gilbert Clark was Christopher C. M. Warren, also known as <coughs> Lev Zion, meaning Heart of Zion. He's British, but grew up in Malaysia, earned a master's degree from Oxford in biochemistry, and currently lives in Sweden. 
He was a Buddhist, but had a born-again experience in which he accepted Christ. However, he didn't know which church he should join, so after extensive investigation, he narrowed his search down to three. Herbert W. Armstrong's Worldwide Church of God, the Moonies, and the Mormons. He then had a vision in which he was told to join the Mormon church. He was baptized LDS, but after a few years, transferred his membership to the RLDS church. He and his wife then discovered and joined Sons Am in Israel, but be he became disaffected when his wife left him and moved to Arizona to become one of Gilbert Clark's, Gilbert Clark's plural wives. Warren then started his own church, the Independent Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which went through a series of name changes and is now known as the New Covenant Assemblies of Yahweh, identifying itself as a Messianic Evangelical Church and rejecting its Mormon origins. He also published 400 of his revelations in a book titled The Olive Branch. The last group I'll be discussing is the True Gnostic Church, which was originally called the School of the Prophets, then the Amen House Institute, General Assembly, and Fellowship, the Fellowship of the Agendai, Tabernacle of God's Peace, and then it became the True Gnostic Church in 2007. It was founded in 1986 by, in Pocatello, Idaho, by Archie D. Wood, who changed his name to Azrael Andai Amen. Wood was born in 1947 and grew up in San Antonio, Texas. Being raised as a Baptist, he frequently read the Bible, although he felt confused about what he viewed as the book's absurdities and contradictions. While recovering from wounds sustained during the Vietnam War, he was introduced to the LDS Church. He was baptized, married, and eventually had seven children. At first, he was excited to find what he felt was God's true church, but his curiosity and searching took him outside of Mormon orthodoxy. As he put it in his own words, just a sec, <laughs> he said, As will so often happen in life, my hopes were soon to clash with reality. For once I became a member of the Mormon church, I found out that what was expected of me was a rigid compliance to church authority. It didn't take long before I came to be viewed by church leaders as someone dangerous to the established order. And soon afterwards, my family and friends began to criticize me for daring to challenge the doctrines of a church which they dearly loved. Yet despite these things, my need to find God, to reach out and touch the eternal mind, to secure at last the benevolent attention of Heavenly Father became more and more acute. On June 19, 1979, he climbed to the top of a mountain to pray, and his prayers were answered. He said, I state boldly and without hesitation that I saw God and that I spoke with the Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother of all mankind face to face. Over the next 20 years, he lived alone in the mountains and continued to be visited by celestial beings. He spent much of his time sitting on, a, on park benches, talking to anyone who would listen to him about his experiences and teachings. He gathered enough followers who believed in his message that they were able to support him financially while he wrote the messages that were being revealed to him. He wrote for more than 20 years, and in 2008, his writings were co compiled into a book titled The Song of God, Living Gnosis of the Agendai. According to Wood, the word Agendai refers to the most powerful and exalted class of gods. This impressive 800-page book was written completely by hand with very little editing and contains 12 sections. Beginnings is an inspired version of Genesis. Yeshua is a harmonized version of the New Testament Gospels that removes all supernatural events, similar to the Jefferson Bible. Wisdom includes revelations regarding Wood's calling as a prophet. Enlightenment introduces concepts of Gnosticism. And the Book of Pearls is a collection of poetry similar to Psalms. 
Then there are seven books referred to as endowments, which contain Gnostic teachings and narrative stories extending hundreds of thousands of years into the future. The seventh endowment is claimed to be a direct revelation from Heavenly Mother. This slide next shows the in, some of the intertextual correspondences between the Book of Beginnings and other LDS scriptures outside of Genesis. Wood's uh, theology uh, promotes a belief in reason, science, and evolution, and can be summed up with this quote, God, who is our future, came from humans who are their past. In other words, God did not exist at the time the earth was created, but God evolved over time from the human species. At some point in the distant future, God the Father and God the Mother, along with many of their children who had also become gods, traveled back in time to the beginning of creation, and all humans are now descended from them. The church's symbol is referred to as the Kai Shamal Kai. The curved lines are a representation of a winged serpent symbolizing a Rita, who is the universal consciousness and supreme mother of heaven. On the left is the star of the Agendai kingdom, and on the right are the seven stars of Kolob. One of the people who came to believe in Wood's message was Court Bramwell, who was a BYU gymnast at the time they met. He became Wood's personal assistant, preparing his writings for publication, creating the church's website and Facebook account, and filming videos of Wood to post on YouTube. Bramwell described Wood in this way, and I find that an interesting painting that was made of him, as well as a photograph. Bramwell said, Imagine Archie as an archetypal combination of the wise old sage, the storyteller, and John Wayne. He was a Vietnam veteran, a proficient woodcarver, and a Bible expert who abhorred Christian dogma and loathed priestcrafters. He was fond of smoking pipe tobacco, was really good at chess, and was an impressive shot with the longbow. He owned few possessions and found joy in simple things. He could inspire, uplift, and clarify in ways that appeared genuinely altruistic and selfless. He could be very gentle and affectionate, patient and long-suffering. Yet, there was another side to Archie that would cast doubt upon the purity of his intentions. Those closest to him were victims of his duplicity and narcissistic abuse. Being a disciple of Israel, with his intensity of will, his strangeness and intelligence, his laser-like focus, was like standing uncomfortably close to a raging fire. Prolonged proximity to Israel, anything more than a few years, was rare among investigators. In the inevitable wake left by his attempts to coordinate believers was left a churning melee of people, scorched and teary-eyed, trying to reconcile the man with his book and teachings. In 2010, Israel moved to Nevada to be closer to his children, and in 2016, he cut off all communication with his followers, apparently abandoning his ministry. Court Bramwell has taken over as the de facto leader of the True Gnostic Church, and their private Facebook group has about 20 members, but there are no church services or sacraments. According to Wood, the only proper religion is humanity itself. There's a lot more that could be said, but I've come to the end of my time. I'll leave it up to each of you to judge the fruits of these Latter-day religious innovators. Are they true prophets, visionary <coughs> mystics, sincere but deluded men, or imposters and con men? Or, maybe like all of us, they might just be a little bit of all of those things. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Mike? Not so much a question, it's just a comment. It's like, how many paths did you have to go down to find all this detail on all these different people? Yeah. A lot. A lot. <laughs> it, it, it's kind of a rabbit hole that leads to more rabbit holes, that leads to other connections, and then, uh, you know, just 
different websites, different books, different sources. Uh, I, you know, that's one of the fascinating things to me is just finding different connections, uh, you know, between different groups and and how one thing kind of uh, relates with another. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, did you think that most of these guys actually believe? There are revelations and angels and stuff, or do you think that they were just making it up? That's the big question, isn't it? Yeah. I, I can't read their mind. I, I think at least a part of them, you know, was sincere. You know, that's my thought is that they, they wouldn't do all of this just, you know, purely. Okay. People could be sincere but have a mental problem, you know? That's true. <laughs> Although, you know, I. Some of, as, as I read the writings that they produced, um, you know, they, they weren't just the ravings of a madman, you know, yeah. there, there's something to it. So, yeah. And then you mentioned about them having followers. Mm -hmm. How did they find their followers? <laughs> so, um, a lot of it's online, you know, yeah. especially more recently um, in the you know, the uh, John Bryant starting in the 70s, I think there was a period of time where a lot of LDS people were going toward fundamentalism, uh, especially joining the Apostolic United Brethren. And there were some people who weren't satisfied with that group, probably, you know, kind of transferred over to John uh -huh. Bryant, especially when they saw... Um, they saw him producing scripture and reminded them of Joseph Smith. So one, one thing I didn't uh, mention, but there's a book titled Sacred Scripture that was published uh, by a man named Mike Rigby in Orem, Utah in 1994. And apparently this book um, sold 10,000 copies. And so Mike Rigby he took some of John Bryant's writings, and also Haver Pratt, and also some of Christopher Namelka's writings, and put it in a book. But he didn't say, you know, who, who the author was. He just said these are restored scriptures that have come into my possession. So, um, after doing a, a lot more, going down some rabbit holes, I, I've discovered that Mike Rigby, he, he didn't join. Um, John Bryant's church, he didn't become a part of it, but he was actually John Bryant's nephew. So there's a connection there. He, he obtained these writings, he published it, he was excommunicated by the LDS church for doing that. But I think those writings, you know, at least 10,000 copies apparently were distributed and that probably gained some converts for him. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yes ma'am. Um, what percentage of these books would you say that would identify themselves as the one true representation <laughs> of the restored, you know, yeah. branch? And which ones would, what percentage would say, we really don't, would really deny that they had any connection? Well, the current Gnostic Temple of the Pearl does not claim to be the one true church. Um, you know, they they have gone a more liberal route, uh, interpreting all scripture metaphorically, um, including, you know, John Bryant's still the leader of the group, but even his uh, write, scriptures and writings, he now interprets metaphorically. So, um, but I, I still think they probably feel like they're the most true church, you know. Um, the others, probably they all feel like they're the, the the truth. Um, the true Gnostic Church is a little more, it, it's more of an online group of people who really like reading the book, the Song of God, so it's not so much a, an active church, but, um, and then the Order of Nazarene Essenes has kind of, it, it's gone as far as I can tell, you know, it's not really active now. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi, there's a debate uh, about what the meaning of Gnostic is. Mm -hmm. Some scholars identifying it 
as mysticism, hermeticism, going back to ancient Egypt, yep. uh, and uh, and coming through the religious uh, uh, traditions of ancient Egypt, spreading through the Roman Empire, and being a, a powerful philosophical, uh, ethical force, while other scholars feel it's just a catch-all phrase. And how yeah. did you use the word Gnostic? Yeah. when you were talking about this group? So I use it in terms of what scholars refer to as Gnostic Christians. Early Christians who were not... Who, so early Christianity had two major divisions, the Proto-Orthodox, which became the Catholic Church, and then the Gnostic Christians who um, ceased to exist for the, you know, pretty much. Um, but there was a, a whole lot of um, variety amongst early Christians, and I'm not an expert on that, but what I'm referring to in my use of that term is people who use the writings of the Nag Hammadi Library, which was produced by Gnostic Christians. But there's an awful lot of other ideas and speculation and, and ideas, even amongst those, uh, the, the writings of the Nag Hammadi Library, there's <coughs> Sethian Gnostics, there's Valentinian Gnostics. I know John Bryant definitely identified himself with the Valentinian, uh, you know, Gnostic persuasion, <laughs> but then combining it with Mormonism. So his writings are kind of, it's basically reminds me of uh, Joseph Smith's inspired translation of the Bible where he would add additional information. Uh, in the case of John Bryant, he would take the Gnostic writings and then he would add Mormonism into it or you know, create a, a new storyline that has Gnost or Mormon doctrine but then add Gnosticism into it. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I subscribe to a thing called Great Courses Online, yeah. and they have two professors talking about St. Augustine, yeah. and before he became a Catholic, he was actually a Gnostic. He was a Manichaean, yeah. which is, yep. Yeah. That's uh, the, the slide mentioned, uh, or at least I mentioned that Manichaeanism combines Gnosticism with Buddhism and a little bit of Zoroastrianism added in there. So, yeah, St. Augustine was, uh, was Manichaean before he converted to Christianity, or to Catholicism. Yes? Uh, so I have a, kind of a, two separate questions. Uh, the first one relates to kind of the what, what seems to be the incestuous nature with these people moving among the different groups. Yeah. Um, I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are. Maybe you could comment on what seems to be possibly a dragging force uh, that, that causes somebody to break off and create yeah. a new one, or break off and seek a new one, uh, a new one of these, these yeah. uh, factions. Uh, and uh, how much that relates to uh, different interpretations in, you know, in scriptures or in what is and is not scripture, or uh, you know, what, what causes that breaking off, kind of, and, and like yeah. uh, uh, how much the community interweaves with itself. I and mean, then I'll have a second question yeah. after that. Well, I think a big factor is someone wants to be the leader, and <laughs> They don't want to be the follower of someone else anymore. And so in the case of Gilbert Clark, it, um, you know, he wanted to be the prophet. He, and uh, there were reports of John Bryant being kind of dictatorial in his actions. And, and uh, so, so that's part of it. Uh, part of it is different interpretations of, of doctrinal issues, of scriptural you know, interpretations. That's a good question, and I, I don't have the absolute answer to it, but I think it, part of it is power, part of it's religious, you know, uh, disagreements, part of it is just maybe um, not wanting to be with certain people <laughs> in, in a group. They want to have their own clique, you know, somewhere else. Or they get kicked out because they're not acting, you know, very nicely toward everyone else, you know. 
Uh, second question as well. Uh, when you, you put up a, a couple of charts that showed, uh, I can't remember what you call it, interdependence. It's, okay. yeah. It's not over there. Uh, when, when you had those different scriptures that were parallel to each other, yes. what, 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 what was meant by that? Is that just straight lifting, copy pasting, or is so, it so much reliance? So it's, it, it's, you know, some scholars call it intertextuality, um, you know, and we find the same thing, you know, uh, quotes in the New Testament from, that come from the Old Testament, quotes in the Book of Mormon that come from the Old and New Testament and so forth. So they were very close, uh, you know, partial quotes or close paraphrases things that weren't really found in any other verses in scripture. So, you know, it's like, oh, I hear that phrase and the only other place that, that it's found is in this, you know, verse in LDS scripture. So I, I consider that a correspondence, you know. In other words, it, it's, just a, it, it's just an observation that um, whoever's writing this is, is recreating some previous material that answers your question well enough but anyone else <laughs> yes ma'am do you happen to know if Denver's Snuffers group is still strong and active yeah. or if it's kind of died out they're, they're growing they're yeah. not dying out um, the estimate is that they have 10,000 followers um, I don't know exactly how accurate that is but in all likelihood they're probably the fourth largest um, group in the restoration movement. Um, the Church of Jesus Christ Bicker tonight being the third largest. Um, I don't know, the Snufferites, or they, they go by the restoration movement, they go by fellowships of the restoration movement, they have several names that they go by. Um, Doctrine of Christ movement is another one. Um, but they, they have uh, podcasts, he, you know, he, he does a lot of speaking, they have conferences, um, so they meet in home-based churches, um, and so they, they, you know, whoever joins a fellowship, they, they're kind of autonomous, it's not a top-down leadership structure, so they can kind of do whatever they want. They pay their tithing to the individual fellowship to help one another. Um, so, where uh, <clears throat> the restoration branches uh, has roughly 10,000 members, but they seem to be shrinking. Uh, same with the AUB, but the Snufferites are growing in size. Yes? Yeah, so I just, okay. When I went to be interviewed by my state president yes. for Temple Recommend, he mentioned that group yes. specifically. He didn't mention any other groups. He just says, do you have any association with that group? Yep. So I guess they feel like they're threatened a little bit by them. <laughs> the LDS church leaders, it's my understanding, that's, they feel that is the biggest threat to yeah. their membership. Second to people leaving the church for either mainstream Christianity or atheism or you know um, more liberal uh, movements they were concerned about that but they're more concerned about the more conservative people leaving and going to the snuff right movement mm -hmm. what they're trying to do is to get back to well they, they think Brigham Young was not a true prophet so they're trying to get back to uh, Joseph Smith's pure Mormonism, which does not include polygamy. Does so include temple? They, they don't have a temple. They are starting a temple fund mm -hmm. with, the with the idea that they might possibly build a temple at some point in the future. But they, they, I do know they printed their own scriptures recently, including revelations from Denver Snuffer. Um, so it's, it's an interesting movement. Um, you know, for those who don't know, uh, Denver Snuffer claims to have seen Jesus Christ in person. And so 
and he, he's a Salt Lake attorney, uh, smart, educated guy, um, good speaker, and yes. Based on that first book that he put out, Zen Comforter, is that what he's wanting his um, group to all experience? Is that kind of his teaching? Is that he's all experience the Zen Comforter? Because that's what he lays out in the book. Yes. That's what he's teaching. That is what he's teaching. I don't know if it's emphasized as much as it used to be, because I think the vast majority are finding that it's not happening to them, and so it's not, I think that's taken away from the forefront, maybe. Um, so I, I want, you know, I, I plan to get more into the snuff right movement. Uh, I'm not an expert on it. But, yeah. I'm wondering where this gentleman is from. Like here, but your state president, are you from Idaho? Or I live in Central Utah. So is that a question that's cropping up in Utah and Idaho Temple right now? Yeah. Because it's not in Texas. Right. It's, uh, Utah, especially Southern Utah, it's mm -hmm. strong there. It's strong in Idaho. It's strong in Arizona. Okay. Um, those seem to be the main places. Texas has five um, fellowships, Snufferite fellowships. I don't know how big they are. They, it might just be single families, but they have a website where you can find, you know, where the fellowship is located. Um, they, they use wine for the sacrament instead of uh, water. Um, so that, that's one of their big points. So somebody who participates, an LDS person who participates in one of their services would be technically breaking the word of wisdom according to LDS standards. Um, yes? Do you, sir, have any evidence that Lori Bellow and Chad Daybell belong to any of these groups? So it's very closely connected, but I don't know... I don't think they were part of the Snufferite movement. And I probably shouldn't use that term. They prefer not to be called Snufferites, but <laughs> it's shorter. Mm -hmm. um, they definitely were not part of any of, of the other groups I mentioned. They, I think they had sympathies and maybe some kind of connections with uh, Denver Snuffer, but I, I don't know for sure if they were participating. I don't think they were. I heard they were. Okay. They were part of a different polygamous group. Oh, that's right. That's right. I don't know the answer for sure, but yeah. Are you familiar with Roger Billings? Yes. Ch Church of Zion. Or, excuse me? He almost qualifies as a Gnostic movement. He okay. He thinks that way of polygamy. And... Yeah. So he's in Independence, right? And I... north of uh, towards out of Monday Island. So my understanding is he, he's, he comes from an LDS background, I think from Utah. He started a scientific company that basically um, is trying to create um, perpetual, like a perpetual motion machine or... Yeah, he had a very successful patent. It made him a lot of money. Yeah. His brother was mayor of Provo. Okay. So I, if I remember right, it's the Church of Zion. It, it, some of the names kind of get yeah. mixed up, but I think that's the name of his group. And I'm not sure exactly what what's happening currently with them, but it might it's, be Steve. The well, yeah, it is. Listen. It's a polygamous group in Missouri. Yeah. That yeah. Yes. Well, I'm a fan. <clears throat> excuse me. This mask kind of making me. Yeah. Um, I'm a fan of obviously the Mormon writings and stuff, but also Nagamati and yeah. and um, uh, sci-fi. Yeah. And that Song of God book, in my yeah. opinion, I think it's a really good amalgamation. Yeah. I really enjoyed that read. So you read it? Yeah, I have. Very read good. It. And yeah. I just I think that if you put it in context with the Nagamati, it's actually pretty brilliant mm -hmm. book yeah um so my question i guess that's more of a comment but yeah. 
you personally, what are some of your more favorite books within the Nag Hammadi Library? Yeah, so I, I don't necessarily have an answer, to tell you the truth. I know that the Hymn of the Pearl, um, I, I remember parts of that. So I would like to study more. Um, I read all of Bryant's writings, like his versions of, of the text. Um, so I don't, I'm not an expert on the Gnostic writings though. Uh, Song of God, I've, I've read most of it. Um, you know, it, so, some parts are uh, a little out there to me, yeah. <laughs> okay, but, uh, but it, t tell me more about what your thoughts are about. Well, I just think that it's, when you enjoy the Mormon writings and kind yeah. of the cosmologies that are mm -hmm. within it, and then Mag Hamadi has so many, well, you were talking about how many Gnostics groups yeah. there are, and it's kind of like there's as many Gnostic groups as there are Gnostics. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Everybody is a little bit different, and within Gnosticism, it's kind of accepted that that's okay to some extent because it's a personal, which is a really foundational Mormon idea mm -hmm. that everybody kind of has their own ability to have their own ideas and stuff. I feel like, so Gnosticism I think works good within mm -hmm. the two different things, but anyway, um, I just like how it is this amalgamation of mm -hmm. these two different traditions and I just think that it's a, it's yeah. a well done product within that idea. Yeah. It is really wild and out there, and especially how you're talking how like, like it's in the future, but then it comes back into the past, and it's like these future beings, so it's got the sci-fi element to it. Yeah. But the Gnostics, in, um, back in the day of the Nagamati stuff, were kind of sci-fi writers in a way, too. Yeah. And so it stands out in that way. Thanks for your input. That's helpful. Interesting. I, I, I was just going to say it, your comment about an amalgamation of different things reminds me of what Joseph Smith was doing, taking all kinds of ideas in his environment and putting them together, kind of picking and choosing the best of, of his different traditions. But yes, sir. Uh, you know, several <clears throat> decades ago now, Jim Emily was a big fan of non commodity writings. Yeah. And uh, especially him and Pearl, and wrote a lot about it, and he helped popularize it among mainstream Mormons. Okay. Eugene Syok also, and his writings. And, but that's kind of lost its luster in mainstream Mormonism yeah. decades later. It, it was a, a blip there. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah hi. Um, you did touch on this um, in places. But do you, do you have anything more that you could add? I'm curious about how, to what extent they observe uh, the uh, word of wisdom, uh, uh, do not drink hot drinks. Yeah. Uh, now, this has evolved in uh, the um, LDS Salt Lake City Church beyond what Joseph Smith left it as, yeah. uh, because he did use wine for this uh, sacrament. He drank tea and so on. So. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what their views are towards tea, coffee, alcohol, tobacco? So, so, so all the groups I mentioned, as far as I know, they do not follow the word of wisdom at all, except the order of Nazarene Essenes when it was in existence um, did not drink alcohol. I don't know about coffee and tea uh, for them, but the others, they they drink whatever they want, <laughs> which is the same as uh, the Apostolic United Brethren that the you know John Bryant came from. They they drink coffee, tea, and alcohol. And, and do they smoke? Is it, is I don't know for sure about that. But is, was there another hand? <laughs> Well, I've gone on quite a while. I don't know if. <laughs> <laughs>
to, yeah, yeah. So most of these different writings by these different guys, are they available online? Yeah, so John Bryant's writings, um, I had to go to different websites to get all of them. <laughs> their, their website is thepearl.com and they have um, most of them there. Um, there's also audio files of John Bryant's lectures on the Gospel of John uh, that are interesting. I, I find him to be, you know, a, a good speaker and, you know, uh, has some good ideas. Um, there's another website called rejectedscriptures.com, which is run by somebody who just, he gets all scriptures from all different sources that, you know, that someone claims to be a scripture and, and puts it on there. So some of John Bryant's writings are, are there. Um, but yeah, the others you can find online as well. The Song of God is online. So how did you know, like, um, what, what names to look for? Were they list, yeah. other people list them? Or? Yeah. Lots of Google searches, yeah. you know, and just coming up with different you know, results and then finding various websites which then have links to other websites. So that's, um, I mean, uh, Steve Shield's book is invaluable for this kind of topic, you know, the, his new edition of Divergent Paths of the Restoration. Um, my interest in this kind of field started back in 2005 when I was in the Navy, deployed to Haiti, and for, for a few months didn't have much to do, it, but I did have a, a laptop with the internet connection part of the day, so I actually, I was thinking of things to, to Google, and I Googled Community of Christ, because I knew they had changed the name recently at that point, and that led me to the Restoration Branches, and the Church of Christ Temple Lot, and the Church of Christ with the Elijah Message, and their, their branches, and then, then I got looking at the polygamous fundamentalist groups, and, you know, and pretty soon I couldn't keep it all in my mind, so I started making a, a Word document that was like 75 pages by the time I was done, and then when I finished that, I found out there was this guy named Steve Shields who wrote a book called Divergent Paths of the Restoration. <laughs> and luckily, you know, pretty much everything I had was also in his book, but he had a lot more <laughs> detail. But, um, and so my interest has just kind of gone from there. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> We want to thank you for tuning in to the WhitmerCast. John Whitmer Historical Association is an educational nonprofit institution. For more information, visit www.jwha.info, where you can meet our team and join the association, read past issues of the JWHA Journal, and get updates on upcoming conferences and events. Our theme music is I Love to Tell the Story, composed by Tom Moraine. This podcast is a production of John Whitmer Historical Association, all rights reserved. Thank you.